Part of the adventure of downtown shopping was the treasure hunt for great deals. Veteran shoppers took this challenge seriously. When we would go downtown, she was looking for bargains. So that meant we were going to go from one store to the next, to the next. Uh, she had already had uh, the articles in the paper, I guess, advertising. So she knew, uh, she had already, like a general, she had already mapped out her plan. We'd start our shopping trip starting at Mays, and we'd go all the way down the street, and we'd go, um, um, let's see, pass by with Teller, go down the basement, see if they had any deals. The first stop was always the terminal tower, the observation deck. Spend some time there. Then I guess it's Higby's. I always look around Higby's. Cross the street to Mays. And then head up Euclid and stop in every store just to look around. But occasionally, the genteel customs of the times were forgotten when there were bargains to be had. The bargain basement was, was quite an experience. It almost brings to mind the old movies where people would fight over the girdle and rip it in half or pull the sleeves out of uh, sweaters. And that's somewhat the way it was, just be like a couple days before Christmas and when they had the markdowns after Christmas. When we had a big sale, we used to uh, see people there at 10 o'clock in the morning, outside the doors, ready, ready to come in and find bargains. I remember the May Day sales that we had. Uh, we didn't do any kind of work whatsoever on the floors because there'd be so many people in here, uh, and especially in the lower level. I mean, you couldn't even walk down there. There would be clothing everywhere and you'd have people struggling over I want this I want that I mean it was tremendous sales back then I have memories of coming to downtown Cleveland as a youngster my mother would always uh, go on Tuesdays only because Tuesday was double stamp day at the May Company and Bailey Company. Stamps were a way for stores to build customer loyalty to keep you coming back you were given stamps when you bought stuff, and when you saved up enough, you could come back, redeem your stamps, and get more stuff. Ego stamps, this was a, sort of a bonus at May Company, and I think my mother shopped mostly at May Company so she could get the Eagle stamps. For every 10 cents you purchased, you were given a little Eagle stamp, and you had a book, and the book was worth $3. And my, when my mother would come home from shopping, she would hand over these eagle stamps and we kids would have to lick them and put them in a book. Green stamps, eagle stamps were my my mother's passion and she collected them and, and I do recall that one time, 1953 or 54, she had filled an eagle stamp book and, uh, I've been told this because I wasn't there with her and she went to May Company and what was she going to cash it in on? Well, it had a new building toy set called American Plastic Bricks, and, and she bought this for me. And as a kid, I became hooked on toy construction sets and, and American Plastic Bricks. Now, I think the irony of this is she got this for an Eagle Stamp book, and today I've been trying to recapture my childhood, so I've been shopping for American Plastic Bricks on eBay, and fortunately, my mother's not around to hear how much I'm paying for the bloody bricks. One reason stamps used to be so popular was because money was tight and credit was hard to get. When charge cards were introduced, it was a real status symbol to have one. But the first one was not today's familiar plastic. It was the much coveted charger plate. Back in those days, we didn't have Visa or MasterCard. We had a, a charge plate that was made out of a soft kind of tin. I know my mother used to say, don't bend it. That's how soft it was. It was one um, metal charge plate, and each store had their own little notch. So depending on what store you went in, they had the, the machine. And if it didn't fit in the notch, then you couldn't charge there. You use the same little, pl little metal thing about this big, and you only had to carry the one. For every store had its own little notch. My mother. My sister and I each had one, and it came in a, um, 
sort of like a little leather case, and you carried it in your wallet and you guarded it with your life. <laughs> the charger plates weren't the only piece of early technology that shoppers still recall. Take a tour around Dillard's downtown Cleveland store today, and you'll find these old clocks, where the lights below the clock face were part of an ingenious color-coded paging system for employees. If your combination of colored lights came on, well, the boss wanted to see you. Or check out these holes located near the high ceilings on the main floor. They're all that remain of yet another favorite memory. Like many department stores of old and specialty stores, they had what's called a tube system. Whereas when you purchase something, whether by cash or check or whatever form of payment you were using, there was a tube which they would take the end off of, insert the pertinent information and send it via these tubes to a room of women who would take care of this and then send it back your receipt in that tube. How the person, the cashier that did the, the money thing, how she knew how to get it back to the right spot, I never did figure out, but it got there. <laughs> it operated on the same concept used at bank drive throughs today. But each cashier station had its own tube, so hundreds of tubes went to clerks all over the store. The canisters were numbered, as were the tubes, so the people who were at Tube Central may change and usually got it back to the right clerk and customer. You'd put it in there and it would suck it up to some place, goodness knows where, and about two minutes later it would come back down and, and drop into a box and the person's change and receipt would be in there. And of course it did save on not having cash registers. Now, how did that work again? Just a nice brass canister that you twist open, put, put the change in there, put the dollar bills in there, fold them up, Twist it shut, lift the uh, top of the, uh, the dead end part of the tube, drop this in, canister goes through the tube, up into the office, they make change. They had the pneumatic tube and, uh, you, you know, you can still hear that sound that whoosh as it went off. There were interesting ways that people got around the stores as well. Moving from department to department was half the fun. Hallie's was fun because they had the woman who uh, worked the elevator, and uh, that was fun. I used to like to watch her. In fact, my sister and I would go home, and we had a glass sliding door on our bathtub, and we used to play Hallie Elevator Lady. <laughs> People who worked at Higby's and ran these elevators were mostly young girls in high school, and even a couple of my aunts and my husband's aunts as, as young teenagers ran elevators, and it was very prestigious because you wore white gloves, and it was a very proper sort of job and it was a whole group of core of people, the young ladies that would do it. They went through training classes, how to greet the people, how to proceed to operate the elevator. It was actually a training class for running the elevator. First off, they, they would push a button that was on the outside, and then that would light up on this panel showing right here what floor the operator needed to go to. So the person would just close the door, just like this. And once they would get to the floor, they would just open the door down the handle like that. Greet the person, have them come in, and just uh, have a conversation with them, talk to them, ride them to their floor, and tell them which was located on all that different floors. Another thing I remember about O'Neill's were their beautiful elevator girls. And uh, there was always a captain, and she stood out in front and had a little clicker and let each girl know when the elevator should go on its way. I was a kid, I was an escalator person. <laughs> I loved esca I love the escalator. It was sort of like, uh, almost like an amusement park ride to a certain extent because, you know, you're going up and around and you could see all the things that are going around too. I always enjoyed the escalators as a kid. You know, if I had to ride them, they got narrower and narrower and narrower. And we knew we were getting near the top when they were real narrow and I couldn't stand next to my brother. <laughs> the other thing was uh, our escalators at Higby's, the new escalators to the front of the store, moved quite quickly. There was a verve about going into Higby's. When you jumped on the escalator, you were shot to the next floor. And you really had to plan your strategies getting on and getting off. I do remember Higby's, and I, up until a few years ago, they still had the old wooden trade escalators and they rattled and creaked and everything, and I do remember those as a kid. A little bit leery to get on it because they were, they were rackety old things. 
Some of the greatest memories of downtown are centered around food. The busy shopper could always get a bite to eat at the locally owned fast food restaurants and diners of the day. In Akron, it might be corned beef at the Stone's Grill or hot rolls at Kazi's. Clevelanders recall the Clark's restaurant's treasure chest for kids, Huff Bakery's cakes and cookies, and Bouquet's Mile High Sundays. And you probably couldn't go wrong with a stop at the Corner Diner or Dime Store Luncheonette. Maybe once a week, my mom would give me the money. I would have my lunch at the lunch counter in Woolworths. They had about the best chicken pot pie you'd ever know. I'd get that for 25 cents and uh, five cents for a Coke. I'd go over to Kresge's or Woolworths and uh, sit at the lunch counter there. And uh, yeah, very fond memories of, of that kind of a food operation. They were bazaars, if you will. They were very interesting. They were fun places. We would have the, the whole place jam packed. The people all walk, seemed to walk all down East 9th Street and I was really crowded. Boss came in. After it was all over, he checked the register and he said, you took in over $100 all by yourself and it was hamburgers were 15 and coffee was 10. So I did pretty good. <laughs> Another simple dining experience was clearly a downtown favorite. We would end the day by going to, uh, and I have great, great memories of that, I'd be ready to pig out, is to go to uh, the Forum, which was up on 9th Street. Uh, cherry pie, uh, chicken, uh, um, uh, fill my plate, maybe go back a second time for a second healthy. Well, you'd walk in and you'd pick up your tray and everything, and then you could just go down this line and you got to choose your food. And I always had their roasted potatoes and probably chicken. That was my favorite lunches. It was a, a, a very nice cafeteria. It's like a school cafeteria, but it wasn't as, as formal as some of the other places downtown. I don't know if you remember the old farm. You know, very popular, very popular. When it up and disappeared, a lot of people was heartbroken because a lot of times people would just come down for that evening meal, you know, because they had such a diverse selection of foods there. You know, and I, as a child, I, you know, I really enjoyed coming down there. A lot of times when we got through shining shoes, we would go get us a dinner. For dessert or a treat, you had to stop and get something that could only be bought in Cleveland, a concoction with a taste all its own, the Frosty. I guess the thing that really stands out in my mind more than anything, especially being a kid, is going, the last thing we would do before we went home is go to Higby's for their malted. And I mean, that was like the highlight of the entire day. We're in the lower concourse of Higby's. And this is approximately where the Frosty Bar used to be. And when you came into Union Station from your train, it wasn't a trip unless you came into Higby's and had a great Frosty. They were so popular at Higby's that Mays somehow got the secret recipe and built their own Frosty Bar. Ah, yes, the legendary Frosty Bar at May Company's. <laughs> now, would always, that would be one of the places you'd have to stop. Go to May Company, go down there and you get a little glass and they fill it with a nice, cool little chocolate frosty and mmm, ah. Oh, the frosted malts. <laughs> that was the original milk mustache. When you got in the basement of both stores, you could buy a frosted malt. Fear not. You can still get an original recipe frosty. This is the machine that the frosty was developed on. Now, most people had it at Higme's, or some people say May Company, <clears throat> and um, that was after it had been developed here and uh, the recipe borrowed. I had to be good all day when I was a kid to get one of these, and it cost 15 cents at the time. It turns out that Mr. Weber, founder of Weber's Custard and Ice Cream in Fairview Park, is recognized as the originator of that unique frosty recipe. Today, David Ford continues the tradition using these rare 69-year-old machines. Uh, it turned out to be an excellent sales tool. Um, once you, they never gave you a spoon, so once you're busy eating it and you, you're eating it down about that far, it won't come out until the heat of your hand basically uh, warms it and then when you're going like this, it'll slide down and get you on the nose. I was hoping it'd be more liquid. It's one of those 
tastes of Cleveland, especially as a kid. He's like, you, as, soon as, you, as soon as you taste it, you remember going, yeah, this, I remember this from downtown. I have that all the time. People come in, they taste this, and they're just blown away. They just, I mean, you can see the years drop off their faces. They become children again. We had one woman start crying. She said, oh, my mother just passed away. And I remember when she took me, you know, when I was a child down to Higby's, down the basement to get it. And that's everyone's experience. They immediately, as soon as they taste it, it takes them back to their childhood. It's like the, the cheapest time machine you can think of. Another great part of being downtown was all the restaurants. In Akron, there was the Garden Grill or the Georgian Room. In Cleveland, people fondly remember Halley's Tea Room or the Mayfair Room. But the place that sparks the most affection was on Higby's 10th floor. We would go to Higby's and then we would stop for our lunch at the Silver Grill. What's special about it is the fact that it is a reminder of a period of time when all department stores in the United States, Canada, Europe, had tea rooms and restaurants. First of all, the Silver Grill was a beautiful restaurant. It was a perfect example of Art Deco architecture. Uh, it had very good food. Uh, it was a great place for businessmen to meet for lunch. Uh, ladies who lunched in those days lunched there. Even though it was a grown-up place with beautiful table settings, linen tablecloths, and real silverware, it also holds a special place in the heart of many boys and girls. This is the truck that little boys used to have their lunches taken in. It was kind of like the original Happy Meal. In the Silver Grill's early days, children would be given their meals in a wooden buffet like this one that was brought to the table. Later on, small metal toy stoves were used, but they stayed at the Silver Grill. And then, kids were given cardboard souvenir stoves to take home, as well as barns, a space capsule, and the famous Higby's truck. So these were kinds of ways that uh, children certainly were a part of this uh, experience, which was very, very uh, uh, clever uh, merchandising as well, because again, it made children welcome, you know, to, you know, to partake of all the other kinds of opportunities of, uh, of uh, seeing what a department store was like. Now, we've been talking about the Silver Grill in the past tense. It's true it's no longer open, but the space still exists. As thousands of others did, we took the elevator up to Higby's 10th floor. With us is Ann Zapancic, who ran the kitchen there for 20 years. I remember how crowded the long lines we used to have. She hasn't been here since the day it closed in 1989. The sign still greets us, but struggles to do so. Lots of memories here. Remember the fish pond there? We used to have a lot of fish there. All the original chairs and tables dating back to 1932 are here, stacked neatly. The silver grills look the same as they did the day it opened. The goldfish pond, home to thousands of fish who entertained kids and adults for more than 50 years. Time feels like it's standing still here on the 10th floor of Higby's. You can almost imagine sitting down and ordering one more serving of beef stroganoff at the Silver Grill. To this day, people